Hello and welcome to the Car Care Note Reviews channel and welcome to the 2024 Subaru Crosstrek. First Subaru on the channel and a very interesting one. Subaru is a very interesting company. We're really glad that we're given the opportunity to review their cars. So here it is. In today's video, we're going to do a proper technical review under the hood, underneath the car. We're going to look at the outside, the inside, some things we like, some things we do not like, and everything in between right after this. Let's start our technical review under the hood. Now, the Subaru Crosstrek could be optioned with two engines, almost identical engines. The first one is a two liter boxer engine. Now, Subaru with boxer, that's their signature, that is their thing. First one is the FB20, two liter boxer engine. The second one is the FB25, boxer engine, four cylinder engine. So, Let's talk about their mechanical construction because they're very similar. There are a few differences here and there which we're going to highlight in this video. The FB20 and the FB25 mechanically, they're similar. We start with a cylinder head. They both have plastic valve covers. This is something that got updated. The initial version of this engine didn't have it. Now we do. This engine has dual cams. You can't say overhead because it is a boxer. It's on the side. So this has four camshafts basically because you have two cylinders here, two cylinders on the other side. The cylinder head is a two-piece cylinder head. Very familiar design with a lot of auto manufacturers except it's a boxer setup. So you have the cylinder head itself which has the valves and the springs and everything and then a kind of a cam cradle or cam tower or holder that has the cams in it and they have sealer in between them. Then this engine has something very curious and something I don't quite understand why they do it this way. This doesn't have hydraulic lifters. This actually has valve adjustments. Now, mind you, the engine has to come out for these valve adjustments, so I hope that's not a common thing. But the way they construct this is, in my eyes, they have an exact same setup as a Toyota, believe it or not. So they have a roller rocker, a little cap that sits on the valve, that cap is actually a shim that you can get them in multiple sizes, and that's how you adjust the valves. And then what looks like a hydraulic lifter, looks exactly like a hydraulic lifter out of many popular Toyota engines, it's actually just a pivot point. It is not a hydraulic lifter. So I feel like they could have, with a revision of this engine, they could have added hydraulic lifters. They didn't. We still have the shim design, which is okay. Moving on to the block, and that is the biggest thing with boxer engines. This is a two-piece block. So two pieces come together and the crank is in the middle. Something interesting about this engine, you can remove the rods without disassembling the block halves. And that is something that they did with the BRZ that you can't. You have to split the block to get the pistons out, which is something just not good. They didn't do that here and that is very good. Now moving on to the fuel system of this engine. This engine has direct injection only. And for reasons unknown to me. I mean, you did the BRZ with Toyota. You took the awesome D4S system. I wish they would have implemented it in all their cars, but they didn't. Understandable. You know, they didn't want to take somebody else's system to, to their mainstream cars. But this has direct injection only. The way this is made, because it is a boxer, so the direct injectors sit right here. They're right on top and they go straight into the cylinder head. They're not like where the spark plugs would be or anything. They do have a high pressure fuel pump right here in the front. It's actually a very good area for it, it's very accessible. This is relatively a simple system, but in the future, this might have carbon buildup issues. And because the boxer orientation, they're not known for heavy carbon buildup issues, but still under certain driving conditions is very possible. Now, this engine has the world's largest front timing cover. Because it's a boxer, it's a huge engine, it has a very large front timing cover. And behind that front timing cover, there's two timing chains, one for each bank, because you have two banks here for the boxer, two tensioners. Surprisingly, the oiling system in this engine is very prehistoric, is the word I'm going to use here, because the oil pump sits in the front at the nose of the crank. This is where the oil pump is. Pretty simple design, it's actually a good design. But then most of the oil travels through this massive front timing cover to go to the 
block first and then the left cylinder head and the right cylinder head it's just a little too much because service with this engine you got to be very careful because the way the or this engine is orientated you got to be very clean because you can actually clog some of these passages and cause major damage so heads up if you're working this engine internal you really need to be very very clean Subaru sealer is another interesting one it's a very strong sealer so cleaning it creates a lot of debris and that's the other issue here. Moving on to the cooling system. And this is where the FB20 and the FB25, the two engine options, they do have a slight difference. This, in this particular model, is an FB20. This is a two liter. Has possibly one of the most basic cooling systems. Mechanical water pump all the way at the bottom of the engine. And then you have just simple thermostat, hoses going in the heater core, and that's about it. And the FB25 though, they have a coolant distribution valve. So kind of a thermal management, it can block coolant for going certain parts of the engine. So you can have rapid warm up. It's just strange that they didn't do it with the FB20, but that's what they deemed necessary and that's what they did. Now let's talk about this engine from a different perspective, from a mechanics perspective. I do have some experience with this style engine from my time with Toyota as technician working on the FRS and currently at my shop. This engine is a boxer. Boxers have their advantages and their disadvantages. Some of the advantages here is it is simple to work on. Believe it or not, you look at this, it looks super complicated, but it is actually not. Because pulling this engine out of this car, for example, is very simple. And then the way it's packaged, especially in the cross track, you have a lot of room. Usually with boxers, spark plugs are difficult. Here you have a little bit more room. And the way they package this entire thing, I think they did it better than the previous version. They thought of a few things. For example, this engine in the past, in the previous versions, had a tendency when you take sharp corners for a long time, they pull all their oil to one big void in the valve cover. Well, in this engine, they actually fixed that. They put a little baffle that took up that space, so now oil won't pull on one side. They did a lot of provisions to this engine to make it even better, but serviceability remains not complicated. That front timing cover is extremely difficult to remove, especially with all the sealer around it. I guess labor cost-wise, if you're gonna do anything to this engine in the future, they're not super high, but you have to have a specialist work on it because that sealer is very difficult and there's a lot of it. And this engine tend to have delicacies with oiling because of the way it's orientated. And some will ask, do we still have head gasket issues? Folks, that is a little bit old for Subaru. Things are getting better. Boxer designs have come a long way. I am not a Subaru specialist, but I do have some experience. I haven't really seen a lot of head gasket issues in the modern ones, especially the this series engine, but time will tell, but they are, however, from the front timing cover, they're notorious for oil leaks. It's a pretty difficult front cover to do in the car without pulling the engine. Pulling the engine is not a big job on this engine, on this car. Now let's talk about the transmission choices for this car. And they chose one. There's no more manual transmission. They only have a CVT. Some people will dislike that. And look, folks, CVTs are complicated transmissions. This is, happens to be one of the better made ones, but they still, compared head to head with a regular six speed, eight speed, whatever the case, this is more complicated. So problems in the future, there's just more with CVTs. That's just the reality of it. Something that comes standard in all Subarus. They're awesome, symmetrical, all-wheel drive. Folks, most cars in this segment, you get an all-wheel drive. It's not really all-wheel drive. When you slip, it starts to assist a little bit. And when you get to a certain speed, it just disengages and that's it. That's how they work. This, however, is a Subaru signature. It's a true all-wheel drive system all the time. All the time that you're driving this car, all four wheels are driving regardless of drive pavement, slipping, or driving normally. That's the best part about this. And they really do this very well. It is trouble-free. It is very reliable and rugged and it works very well. But something else that it does, if one wheel does start to slip, it actually can send less power to it. Not huge where it cuts it out, but it sends more power to the rear if, if the front wheels are slipping, for example, to help push you out of situations. It's a very clever system and it works really, really well. And the best part about it is it doesn't add all these complicated components. It's just engineered well. Things that are engineered well, they're not complicated because the complication was in the design, not in the execution. And this is one of those systems. 
So both models, your 2.0 and 2.5, will have the same CVT except one change. The torque converter on the 2.5 is different than the 2.0. And then they will both have, and this is the case with almost all Subarus, standard symmetrical all-wheel drive, which is just epic in my opinion. But the last thing they did here that is very interesting. See, this engine used to have a vacuum pump on the other side. Direct injection engines will have low vacuum, so they need to have a vacuum pump to assist the uh, vacuum operated power brakes. Well, here you actually have a block off plate for that. It is still there because this engine was designed with a vacuum pump. You have a block off plate. And the reason for that is they got away from your grandpa's vacuum booster. They have an electronic one. Beautifully sits right here, works very well. And the feel of brakes in this car are immediate. This is not a like a hydraulic booster that is electronically controlled. This is actually a very clever system that they used here. Eliminating your vacuum pump, it's very simple, it works very well, and you do feel it when you hit the brakes. They just feel more immediate. And that is a very good change that they did. Let's take a look underneath the 2024 Subaru Crosstrek. Starting with everything is covered up, at least in the front. They do, however, give you a little opening here for your trim plug. Oil filter at the top, pretty simple. So this is not, people always dislike covers. Covers are actually there to protect things, and this is a good thing. Let's talk about the front suspension and brakes. So you have a steel lower control arm. The ball joint is kind of upside down from what you normally see. It is in the knuckle, but it is separate from the knuckle. You can replace it separately, which the knuckle is steel. It is not aluminum. Then you move around here, two piston caliper, and the front design is a typical McPherson design. Pretty rugged, pretty simple, no thrills, nothing really over the top. Then we look at the transmission. This is the... I don't want to call it the deal breaker for some people, but this is what worries some folks. Folks, this is the CVT transmission, the linear tronic transmission is what Subaru calls it. It is a massive unit simply because this also has the front differential. Remember, this has a very cool all-wheel drive setup, and we'll talk about it a little bit here. Aluminum pan, you notice it's not plastic. This is actually an aluminum pan. Folks, in my opinion, this is a good CVT, but CVTs in general, they're very complicated. They have a lot of stuff going on. And generally, if you don't maintain these, you're driving in certain driving conditions, they're not the most reliable. That's just the thing with CVTs. But this is a good CVT. It is, at least from all my research and kind of making sure this information is correct, this is made in-house by Subaru and his parent company. This is not made by, for example, Jatco or somebody else. That is what I found in my research, but if you look at the little details, you look here, here's a shifter cable. Super accessible, not buried on top of the transmission or somewhere where you don't want it to be. And also integrated with it is the front differential, which is right here. You see the axles coming out of it. A little harder to see, but if you look here, you'll actually see one of the axles coming out of it. That's how this system works, and it's a pretty cool one. You notice, it is a rear wheel drive configuration with the front wheels being driven, but unlike many other cars, they don't have a transfer case that turns the power around and sends it to a separate front differential. This is designed to be this way, and that's what makes this system superior to anything you're gonna find in a car like this, short of a truck with four, true four wheel drive. Now, the exhaust, exhaust on Subarus are typically decent good, decent quality and it shows i like that they have flex flex joints right here they don't have flex pipes and as we move around to the back you see the drive shaft right here that goes not from the transfer case straight from the transmission into the differential now the differential it is a little cute differential because even though this is symmetrical all-wheel drive it is not meant for heavy off-road like you're not going to go rock crawling with this differential or pull a giant boat behind you but it is if you notice cast iron in the body which makes it a lot stronger even though it's small it is a lot stronger unit because to me this is as good of an all-wheel drive as you're ever going to get in any other car looking at the rear suspension pretty interesting rear suspension you have a 
double wishbone set up at the top and then a few arms at the bottom. It's a pretty simple setup and you notice how much room you have. It's not busy with a lot of arms and a lot of complication. It's pretty simple suspension, works pretty good. You do have the shock right here with the spring right on it. It's not two separate things, which makes service actually better. We look in the back, single piston caliper with the integrated electric parking brake, which I think it's a brilliant design. Then we look in the back and you notice something here, the Subaru that I like. Single muffler, goes out the side, nothing really about it. And I got a flex joint here, which is very good. You want to see this more in cars. And then look at this. They actually attempted to cover the sides. Not 100% covered, but they attempted a little bit. Same thing on this side. Then you just leave it wide open. Let's take a look at the outside of the Crosstrek, starting with the front. This car is a kind of a practical, functional car, so it's not going to have the best looks on the planet. But I feel like there's a lot of kind of copying, perhaps, from other manufacturers, because this headlight reminds me of this car. Now, the front grille is typical Subaru. There's not much going on. There is not a radar sensor behind the emblem. And that is something that Subaru kind of did very special and very different. If you look here, you not only have one camera, you actually have three. And that's what they do here. This is called the EyeSight system. Works very good. And it's, this is where Subaru occasionally will want to do things their own way. The Subaru way. If I would put it in one way, just for you guys, if you're not familiar, Subaru is the Volvo of Japan. They always does things their own special way. And unlike Volvo, most of the time, they do things well. And that is one of them. This is a brilliant system that actually works much better. Your cameras are up here, not in the front. You get in a front little accident, you don't have to calibrate radar sensor and all this mess, they're up here. That's the cool thing about that. The hood is a very, really featureless hood does have a little dip here does have a little very minor line in it but this car is not overstyled. it's not really meant to be a showstopper looks wise but function is whether they did it good look at that look how high that bumper is off the ground for most folks they're not really into cars they just need a car to drive around and light off-road and whatnot this is very good they didn't overstyle the front bumper and then make it super low to the ground where you hit it on everything. It's very high. Same story on the side. I mean, the side is very high when you compare it to many cars that are similar to this. And this gap is not huge. They didn't just lift the body. They actually designed it this way. And that's the cool thing. But something curious here. This is, how should I say it? not the fastest car on the planet it's actually quite the opposite of that it's one of the slowest cars in the planet we have very elaborate brake vents over there and here i guess they deem that necessary but it's a little overkill but that's okay brakes are actually pretty big on this and they feel great as we talked about it this has an electronic booster and that is pretty cool then this is very objective but this is just my opinion i don't like that these have a strange shape just to emphasize the arch it's just a very strange shape and i like symmetrical thing and this just doesn't doesn't rhyme with me and for some reason the mirror is a different color than the rest of the car it's okay they ran out of blue paint but i'm not into that stuff again this is very objective it depends on taste now this car does have a smart key or a keyless entry deal you only have it in the front you do not have it in the back at this price point no complaints because this car, we'll talk about it in a little bit, when it comes to price point, things are very well. This is an optional ladder style thing on the top here. Looks very odd, and I feel like it adds a little bit to the wind noise because you have this. So unless you really have a heavy use for this, don't get this option. Just thought I'd mention that. As we wrap around, we have the same situation here. Again, objective, it's kind of an odd look that it's not a round circle. Then we move to the back. It has a very typical Subaru look, but it also, if you look at this exact line right here, doesn't it remind you of this car? And then if I cover this part, doesn't it also remind you of this car? I feel like 
you know, they're all Japanese companies. They all like to share their designs, and they're good designs. I think this is not offensive. That's the best way I'm going to put it. It's not a showstopper, but you drive this every day. You're not going to look at it one day and go like, this is an ugly car. It's not. Looks good. It's functional. And speaking of functional, this matters. Look at this space. It's a decent space for a car that is not super big. It's very easy to drive. This is a lot of space. And the other thing is that I love, you got a spare tire. Because they're not going to go with the trends and not give you a spare tire. So that is something very good. You notice there's no power back door. It's very simple because you don't need it. This is a very light door. You don't need the complication and now the price start going up and up. Very simple. You want to fold the back seats. Now you have a lot of room. I, I like the functionality of this car, as you'll see more when we talk about the interior. Let's take a look at the interior of the 2024 Subaru Crosstrek. And the first glance when you get in this interior, it's very basic. And that's the whole point of this car. This car at this price point is actually a lot of car. And that I feel like was objective of this car. Let's start with the gauges. There are two mechanical gauges with a screen in the middle. Works perfectly fine. Gives you enough information that you need. No gimmicks, no thrills. Works very nice. Then the steering wheel. The only thing I have about the steering wheel is it's a little busy. There's a lot of buttons. And I understand that with modern cars. It is laid out okay. The drive mode is on the steering wheel, which is something I haven't really seen in a lot of cars. Then we move in the middle here. Mechanical shifter as we looked when we looked at the cable underneath the car. Beautiful mechanical shifter, works perfectly fine. Doesn't really, no thrills about it. Very easy to operate. Heated seats in this particular model that has it. Physical button, high and low, not 17 settings, just very simple. Electronic parking brake, which is right here, very simple as well. Plenty of storage. This center console is actually pretty large, which is nice. Then we move into the middle where we have a massive screen here. Something to be said about the screen. It's very big, so when you put it in reverse, for example, only a little bit shows up. That's usually the problem with big screens. And then at the very bottom of the screen, you have your HVAC controls, which I wish the word here, I feel like there is some oversight here. For example, your auto buttons on the side, that's actually customizable. You can add things, but I feel like we have a lot of empty space where you could have added more features like the AC, the auto, we only are confined to choosing one that appears. That's okay. But then the brake hold, I mean, we have all the space, we could have put the brake hold button right here. No, instead you have to go to car settings, then turn on the brake hold. Very distracting when you're driving, if you want to just turn it on. That is a small oversight. In a perfect world, this would have been a smaller screen and we would have physical HVAC controls right here. But they didn't do it that way, and that's okay. Seats are very comfortable, and this is something to be said about older Subarus. They typically don't have the most comfortable seats on the planet. That is something of a Subaru thing. These seats, I was pleasantly surprised that they're super comfortable. They're fabric. Nothing wrong with that. They work pretty well. Again, at this price point, this is a lot of car for this money. I mean, this interior, it's not exotic materials and everything is super nice leather and whatnot, but everything you touch, it's plastic, but it's well-made plastic. It doesn't feel like cheap and rattly. No, it's actually pretty well-made, and that is the good part. Now, driving this car is very loud, to be expected. This is not a luxury car in any way, shape, or form. It is decent. The engine is pretty loud, and adding CVT to that, an under underpowered engine, uh, this is pretty loud. But again, for a basic car at this price point, it is a lot of car for the money. And then again on the oversight part, the last thing. If you look at the door handle on the door panel, it is kind of a different material. They're trying to make it a soft touch. But if you touch the end of it, it's just this squishy little thing that just feels like just not nice. It doesn't feel like a soft touch material. I don't know what kind of material it is. It just feels like a not a good attempt at making a soft touch material. I really wish it would have just been the same typical plastic. Would have been fine. Let's take a look at the back seat of the Crosstrek. 
I am 5'7", this is my driving position. I have decent knee room, decent headroom, pretty comfortable here. Knees are a little bit up, but that's how it is with newer cars. This is a comfortable place to be, even for adults. You do have some USB and USB-C right here. Things are good. I like this back seat. It's actually a functional back seat. Pretty comfortable place. Life is good. Let's talk about some things I do not like about the 2024 Subaru Crosstrek. Starting with the infotainment system and the HVAC control situation. So the infotainment system, it's a nice large screen and that's very good. A little bit laggy, a little bit slow. That is also okay. But I feel like they removed the physical controls for the HVAC and they put them at the bottom of the screen and it's always there and that's also good. But I feel like they could have done this a little better. I mean, you can customize which switches you want out, but I feel like there's space at the bottom that you could have put all these controls visible where I don't have to go into the screen to change which buttons are always visible. That could have been done a little better. And the other thing is, certain physical buttons got removed into the screen. For example, your automatic brake hold or automatic vehicle brake, brake hold basically. You have to go into car settings, turn it on, which if you don't hit it just right, it'll just not do anything. That could have been a button because I'm driving and I'm stopping at a traffic light. We want to activate something like that. You have to go on the screen. That should have been a physical button, would have been made, made it a lot better. But moving on from the infotainment system, the biggest thing with this car is it is slow. It is extremely slow. I mean, usually when cars have a CVT, they will roar and roar. This is very underpowered. And even if you drive the 2.5 liter version, it is still slow. It's a little better, but still. If you are the kind of person that have a heavy foot, this will really get in your way. And merging into traffic, you will notice that the thing is struggling to go. That is one of its downsides. It's too slow. So the 2024 Subaru Crosstrek. Folks, Subaru is a unique company. They do things the Subaru way, not the way the automotive industry is, is going. The automotive industry is going in a way where every car has to be flashy. Basically, everybody is expecting these cars to be a hot Ferrari on wheels. But what that's doing is it's raising the prices of these cars. This one, however, doesn't suffer from that. It's a basic transportation car that is well made, is not the most reliable car in the world, but it is up there in reliability. And the other thing is you step into this interior, it is easier to operate, easy to work, no flashy exotic materials. No, everything is rugged and well made. But the biggest reason you would buy a car like this is this beautiful all wheel drive system. Folks, every single SUV and crossover in this size or in this segment, if you would, they don't really have an all wheel drive system per se. It waits for you to slip, then engage, or it is disengaging as soon as you get to a certain speed. This has four wheel drive, all wheel drive, symmetrical all the time. I see the buyer for this car like this, a young family that likes the great outdoors. Not all the time. We're not going to drive to the top of Mount Everest and back every other day, but we're going to go some off-roading, light off-roading even a little bit heavier off-roading than you would think this will take, it will take it because it's really that good, the all-wheel drive. And the other thing is because Subaru is a sensible company, they don't make things following trends. They make things the Subaru way. That ground clearance is excellent because they didn't overstyle the bumper to make it all the way to the ground. This car though is not perfect. No car is. There's good and there's bad. Some of the negative stuff about this car it is slow, hopelessly slow. I mean, this is not a car that you're going to be winning any medals for speed. And the best thing about this car is if you are a parent and you buy this for your young child, they will not get in trouble even if they try to. I guess that is the good thing of that. And the second thing is the infotainment system could use some work. I feel like they're heading in the right direction, but there are certain things if they do it and I see them as simple software changes, it will make this even better. Now, the lack of physical buttons on the interior for certain things that are important, that is the only place where they crossed into the modern times and didn't do it physical button. They actually went on the screen, but 
at least the elated downward is always there, and I guess that is a good thing. Folks, I hope this video was helpful and informative. I hope you learned something new. If you like it, consider giving it a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing to the channel. Check out some other videos. Until the next video, folks, may the Lord bless you and keep you, and you have yourself a wonderful day.